All right, Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. With all that Paul has said over the last couple of chapters, you can get the impression that Romans is a little bit of a downer. Uh, especially when Paul concludes chapter 7 of Romans and he starts to talk about that internal struggle, the wrestling, the battle within when it comes to the living of his faith, what he wants to do, he can't do, the things he shouldn't be doing, those are the things he's engaged in, and it's a constant tussle. And as we were wrapping up last week, I suggested that that is a a wonderful thing for Paul to provide in his writings to give us a little bit of transparency and to show us that even this great missionary, this strong man of faith, had his own battles. So many times we look at our heroes of the faith and we believe that they're above and beyond human. There's no way that they deal with struggles, that they wrestle with personal problems, addictions, challenges. But here Paul shows us that not everything was perfect in Paul's life at all times, and not everything is going to be ideal in any of our lives. Whether we're new to the Christian faith or whether we're seasoned veterans and been living according to Scripture for many, many years, there's going to be something in there that's still trying to be molded and shaped into a Christ-like image, something that still needs to be yielded over to God. And so we're grateful that Paul gives us that openness, that honesty concerning his own spiritual journey. And it's from that that we move into Romans chapter 8. And there are several places in Romans 8 that are very familiar to us, especially when you get toward the second half of Romans chapter 8. There's some words there that are very encouraging and life-giving during dark and difficult times. There are passages there that we've probably at least heard taught or preached on or maybe even memorized portions of, and we hold on to those words that nothing, for example, can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And if God is for us, who can be against us? There's so many things there that we typically come back to when we're facing some kind of trial, some kind of tribulation in life. But before we get to that, we need to look at the first half. And that's going to be our focus for this morning is chapter 8, verses 1 through 17. As we begin in chapter 8, we hear these words. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I'm going to pause there for just a moment. I'm going to try not to get held up too long with that short verse, but that is a very important verse, not only within the book of Romans, within Paul's writings, but really when we think about the New Testament and what it means to experience salvation through Jesus Christ. A lot of times when we think about the plan of salvation, the Romans' road of salvation, we'll key in on those verses that we've already looked at. For all have sinned. For the wages of sin is death. But now we have some good news that death doesn't have the final say, that sin does not have to win the victory because what we experience in Christ is essentially a new verdict. When you think about condemnation, what do we usually think of? What does condemnation mean? Death. Death? As in the sense of a court case, someone has been sentenced, they have committed murder, they're either put on death row or they get multiple life sentences in prison, don't they? Pretty much that's the end of life as they know it in the ordinary outside sense of freedom. What else comes to mind? It may not be death. It could just be punishment. Or we may use the term consequences. Now, if the wages of sin is death, and all of us have sinned, the good news is the story doesn't have to conclude there because of what Christ has given us and what we receive through God as a free gift. 
The scripture tells us there's now no longer any condemnation. It doesn't mean that God condones the things that we're still going to slip up and do in our lives from time to time, but now we no longer fear the ultimate separation from God when we leave this world, when we leave this life. Paul says there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We still have to live lives that are accountable. We still need to do things in a responsible manner that glorify God. But now our verdict, our being in the presence of God takes on a whole different meaning, a whole new significance because of what we receive by trusting in Christ through faith. And that should give us a big sigh of relief. We should... <sighs> that should really give us a peace on the inside when we think about what... Christ has done in order to change the verdict where we once stood guilty in our sins, now that standing, that status before God has been changed where we're declared innocent, but not because we got things right, not because we were put out on good behavior and we had to do some good ordinary community service, but we're set right, not because of us, we're set right because of what God has accomplished for us on our behalf. And from there, Paul says, For the law of the Spirit of life in Jesus Christ has set you free from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And to deal with sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, so that the just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Did you get all that? There is a lot condensed in those few verses right there. And once again, we find that Paul is using the language of law and spirit and freedom and bondage and the new nature and the old nature. But here he's going to describe all of that and what has been done to resolve the human situation a little different than what he's done in previous sections of the Scripture. Here he talks about what we've achieved and experienced through Christ. And in verse 3 it says specifically what God has done that the law could simply not accomplish. I think we've established between our Galatians study in the fall and what we've been through so far in Romans that the law had good intentions and it had a good purpose in the beginning and as Paul has said the law in and of itself is not a terrible thing, but it just simply wasn't enough. It wasn't completely sufficient to rectify the problem that is in each of our lives because of that human sin nature. And so to solve that problem, here we find Paul saying that a different solution was needed. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. We go back and forth within this letter between the words of sin and flesh. Sin falling short of God's glory. Flesh being not necessarily this body of flesh and bone and eternal organs that we live this life with, but those tendencies that are not necessarily in line with God's plans and purposes. Desires. Desires. Things that consume us and control us and dictate us that are outside of godly character. But when you think about it, sin is a problem <laughs> 
in the flesh. It's a problem for us as human beings. And what we find Paul suggesting here is that since sin was and still is a problem that occurs in this world, on this earth, in this life, through these bodies of flesh and bone, he sent his son Jesus in the same form that we are. God became human. Now certainly God could have snapped God's fingers and said something like, away with sin, and banished it for all of time and eternity. But to deal with a problem in this life, a problem that we struggle with in these bodies, God took on the same form that we are in order to solve our problem. Does that make sense? A lot of times people wonder, well, why did God have to become flesh and bone? Well, one, God didn't have to do anything, but in order to completely relate to us, he took on the same form of us that God had created in the very beginning, and it was going to be through that means that God was going to bring salvation which the law could not achieve to the rest of humanity. His son came in the likeness of sinful flesh. That's not saying that Jesus was sinful, but he came in human likeness, that Jesus was indeed God, but at the same time was fully human. And that's something we're going to talk about, not this Sunday, but in the coming Sundays in our worship service where we're focusing on the essential beliefs of who we are as Christians and what we believe and why we believe that to be important. This week we finish up our focus on we believe in God. Well, the next part in our affirmation of faith, we believe in Jesus Christ, God's Son. Well, what do we say about Jesus Christ, that he is God in human flesh and bone? And it's one of the toughest things to deal with. And really, when you expand it a little bit more and you talk about the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, then our understanding of God gets much more complicated than it already is. And there have been a lot of people down through the years who've wrestled with that Jesus is a human being, but we know who we are as human beings and we know our tendencies as human beings how can Jesus be human and then still not sin but yet the scripture talks about that he was tempted in every way just as we are it's one of those mind-blowing sort of moments but that's what Paul presents to us here to fix a problem in this life God didn't deal with it remotely you know, there's certain things. I remember when I worked at Pitt Community College in the help desk for the IT department for a short time, people would call in, and there were times that you could talk with them over the phone and try to explain something to them. You could do it, as we would say, remotely. You don't have to get up, walk across campus, sit at their desk, and actually work hands-on with their computer. But then there were times that were just beyond the phone call, right? In a sense, and I know that's a very simplified example, but that's kind of what we find God doing with our problem of sin. Instead of fixing it remotely out here in heaven, away from earth, away from us as people, heaven comes down to earth. And that's a pretty radical view of God, especially when you think about this past Sunday when I was talking about God being personal and God being Father. Because so many people, even in this present life, this world today, have this concept that God is withdrawn from our concerns. That since God is holy and righteous and perfect, God doesn't want anything to do with the filthy condition of this evil world. And when you think about it, God has every right to say, all right, that's the end of humanity. 
I created in the beginning. Adam and Eve disobeyed. I recreated. Noah messed up. I'm finished. I tried it, and I'm fed up with these people because they keep getting it wrong over and over and over again. But what does God do to solve our problem? Instead of God getting farther and farther away, God comes down to us. And that's what Paul is emphasizing here. God isn't a hands-off God, but God is personal in the sense that he took on our human flesh in order to fix the sinful problem that we do in our human flesh. He condemned sin in the flesh so that the just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And it's important to think about what Paul is saying here in this verse. Just as Christ became human, came into our world, and just as Adam sinned and brought the sin nature into the world, as we've looked at in the past couple of chapters where Paul keeps saying, be dead to sin, let that old nature die, put it aside, don't revisit it ever again. Just as Adam essentially represents all of humanity for all of time and history, that fallen nature, that sinfulness within us, here we find that our salvation, Jesus, represents all of us as well. There's Adam who represents the fact that we are a fallen, broken people who disobey God, who deserve separation and punishment from God. But then Jesus comes in and Jesus dies, is resurrected. And in a way, in that moment, Jesus represents all of humanity instead of all of us dying. And even though Jesus didn't have the problem with sin, Jesus said, just as sin has been created in the world through humanity, I'm going to come in and I'm going to resolve the problem by representing all of humanity. And so essentially what happened to Jesus and what Jesus accomplished through his death, burial, and resurrection then becomes applied to all of humanity. Just as Adam and Eve fell in the beginning and sin came to be part of who we are down through the generations, now through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, his defeat of sin through his death and resurrection, his defeat of death and hell through his death and resurrection becomes applied and available to all of humanity, all of us who will receive it. And it's important not just to receive the gift, it says so that the just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And that's a key word in Scripture when we talk about this journey of faith. Walking it out, living it out, practicing it. We're walking in some direction in life. Either we're walking toward God or we're walking away from God. And here Paul lays down the alternatives. For those who are now in Christ, who have received the gift of God's salvation, we choose to no longer walk according to the ways of this flesh, but we now long to walk in the Spirit. In verse 5 it says, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, set their minds on the things of the Spirit. To set the mind on flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For this reason, the mind is set on the flesh is hostile to God. 
It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. One of the key words there to what Paul says is this right here. Our mind. How often do we sit down and think about what we think about? <laughs> Probably not any at all, if we're completely honest. But Paul here is saying that what's going on on the inside is going to dictate a whole lot of what's going on on the outside. That which can't be seen. People can't see my brain turning and working and thinking and processing things. But what goes on here, and a lot of times we'll say what's going on here in our hearts, it's going to manifest itself in who we are, what we do, how we walk, which way we're walking. Are we walking according to the flesh? Or are we walking according to the spirit? The mind has to be filled with some good things in order for it to do what God wants us to do in life. And whatever you dwell on in life is often what you become in life. If I allow negativity, hate, anger to consume my life, then that's what's going to be what controls my life. If I sit around and eat junk food all day, that's going to take a toll on my health down the road. It may taste good, it may look good, but it may not be the best thing for me. The same thing, whatever I've put into my mind. And that's affected by what we see. Whether it's sitting around watching the news all the time. Who we associate with what we read, what we search the internet for, it ultimately turns into what we do. If I'm putting garbage in up here, then garbage is going to direct my thoughts and eventually garbage is going to come out of my way of living. And to that, Paul would say, is walking according to the flesh. Thoughts or comments at this point? I know that's just eight verses so far, but thoughts or comments on what Paul has said about this life in the Spirit, keeping our minds on the right things. You've got to have life and peace. And that's what Paul is going to say comes through this living in the Spirit. It gives us life. It gives us peace. Those are two of the gifts. It gives us life abundantly in this life plus the assurance of eternal life one day in heaven with Christ and it gives us a sense of peace that the world simply cannot bring into our lives through all of its chaos, confusion and so forth. Let's pick up at verse 9. Here's the alternative though. He tells us we can't please God, we can't do anything to glorify God. If we're in the flesh, then we're hostile to God. We're not on friendly terms with God. But at verse 9 he says, You are not in the flesh, you are in the Spirit. Since anyone or since the Spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. But if Christ is in you, Though the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through his spirit that dwells in you. Again, another section of verses that are really loaded with a lot of material, a lot of really deep thinking on Paul's part and certainly some good words for our living today. Paul says there's an alternative. For those of you who are seeking to live this life of Christ, you're not 
being dictated by the flesh. You're now trying to walk in step. You're playing, not, I don't mean playing in a bad, in, in a funny kind of way, but you're, it's like follow the leader. We remember that as a child playing follow the leader, whatever the leader does is what we're supposed to do. And determining what is leading our lives is going to dictate kind of where we end up. If I follow the flesh, then this. But if I'm following the Spirit, as Paul says, since the Spirit dwells in you, then I'm also in the Spirit. I'm in the Spirit. The Spirit's in me. It's kind of like being in our atmosphere and having access to oxygen. We're in it. The oxygen's present. We breathe it in. We have life because we're in the air. And that same concept can be applied to what Paul is saying about this new life in Christ and being in the Spirit. It's the Spirit that's now giving you life, that's giving you that spiritual oxygen to keep going, to keep doing and being what God wants you to be. But then Paul kind of changes midstream there for a moment. If you don't have the Spirit, then you don't belong to Him. But if Christ is in you, verse 10, though the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. Now, when we accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we don't die right then, do we? But yet what Paul says here is you're in Christ and the body is dead. He's been talking a whole lot about the sin, the flesh. Now he says something about the body being dead. Well, if you think about it, just because we accept Christ as Savior and Lord doesn't bring an end to death of the physical body, does it? We may continue on for a number of years into the future, but eventually, unless Christ returns, this body is going to start to break down and it's going to die. But for those in Christ, there's only one death, right? I might die to this flesh. I might die from this life as we presently know it. But as I've heard many preachers say, my last breath in this life will be my first breath in God's eternal kingdom. But also remember my home pastor a number of years ago saying that this, he simplified it. He says, if you're born twice, obviously you're born into this life, got to live somehow, so you got to be born. If you're born twice, you only die once. I'm born into this life, but at some point I respond to the conviction of the Holy Spirit and am born again, as Jesus told Nicodemus in John chapter 3. That when it comes time for me to leave this world, I'm not afraid. We die only one time. But my pastor went on to say the flip side of that is if you're only born one time, you're born into this life. You're presented with the gospel. You have opportunity to experience salvation through Jesus Christ. But over and over and over, you reject being born anew, being born again from above through Jesus. Then when you hit the end of this life and you leave this world, you die twice. Your body dies and is placed in the grave. But because you don't have that personal saving grace at work in your life, you also die spiritually. You die separated from God for all of eternity. And that's a strong way of looking at things. It's simple, but then at the same time, it's a powerful way of looking at things. And Paul may not have used those exact words, but in a way, that's what Paul is implying here. 
this flesh is going to die at some point in time. You're not going to be immortal in this world. Try to be 10 feet tall and bulletproof. Try to think you can do this, that, and the other to preserve your life in this. No, at some point this body's going to die. But if you're in Christ and Christ's spirit is living in you, then there's life. But it's a different kind of life. It's a different quality of life. And I like the way Paul says where I concluded just a moment ago that just... As Christ was raised from the dead, so also we will be given life to our bodies. And that's one of the things we hold to. It's a guarantee that we haven't experienced just yet because none of us has died yet. But Paul is saying, here is the guarantee. Because you are in Christ and because the gift of His Spirit is living in you, guiding and directing your choices, your actions, your behaviors, it's as though it's a guarantee already of what God is going to do in the future. And if Christ resurrected from the dead, that same blessed assurance awaits us when we leave this life. We may die, but we know there's a different kind of life that's beyond anything that this world can afford. And that's the hope that we hold on to, that this life is not the only life. This is not the only world. There's a place that doesn't have tears being shed. There's a place where people no longer have aches and pains, where cancer no longer consumes bodies, where tragic accidents no longer take lives. And that guarantee, even though it may seem like it's out there in the future sometime, we're able to face the future because we live in hope. That no matter what happens to my body in this life, if I know Christ and the Spirit lives in me, I don't have to fear death because the same one that resurrected Christ and the same one who has freed me from my sins is also going to raise me up to new life in a different place that is so radically different and better than this world. Thoughts or comments at this point? And that's the key thing, is dwelling in us. Dwelling in us, the Spirit. Not just sitting there in a closet somewhere or pushed over in the corner, but when the Spirit truly dwells in us, we have a new Lord, a new Master within our lives. The Spirit doesn't simply want to exist in our hearts. The Spirit comes into our hearts to show us how to live. To be, as Jesus said, my Father will send the Spirit, a comforter, an advocate, to be with you. Even though I'm no longer going to walk this life in the flesh, I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm going to send the Spirit. And when the Spirit comes, it's like having that constant, ongoing presence of Christ. Even though Jesus may not literally be standing there in flesh and bone, I know Jesus in a very different sense because Jesus is here. Jesus is here just like Jesus is there. All places, all times, all circumstances, Jesus is there when he lives in us. And it's that strength that we lean on for the living of these days, these dark and difficult times that can be so very overwhelming. And it's about the Spirit. When the Spirit lives in us to give us that peace, that sense of calm in the storm, that sense of hope in the midst of difficulty. He abides with us. And now we come to the text I preached on Sunday. <laughs> Verses 12 through 17. So then, brothers and sisters, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die, but by the Spirit you will put to death 
the deeds of the body, and you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit are children of God. For you do not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs of God and join heirs with Jesus. If, in fact, we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. Paul moves to a different image, a different illustration of what it means to be in Christ. Not only do we experience forgiveness of sins, we also enter into a new family, a new kind of relationship with God where God essentially adopts us and treats us as children. Not as, oh, those are my adopted kids versus my true son, Jesus, but as full-fledged children of God. You know, sometimes when people adopt children, there may, especially if they already have biological children of their own, there can be some tendencies, well, that's really my child and that's not really my child. But I'll tell you one of the most beautiful things is when you hear a parent, parent say that that's my kid. I don't even refer to him or her as being adopted any longer. And that's what God does for us. He receives us into his family, not to treat us as though we're second-class children, but he treats us as if we've been there the whole time, as if we never went astray, just like the loving father in the parable of the prodigal son coming back home. Even though he had done some stupid things and been wasteful in his living, the father didn't listen to all of his excuses. He received him back into the fold as if he had never left. That's what God does for us. We're adopted. And that's something that was very important in the culture of Paul's day and time because adoption was a pretty tedious process. And it was a very binding process. And we know what people go through nowadays with adoptions. You have to go through home investigations and studies and this and that to prove that you're a good, safe environment. And so very complicated in our culture. But to show you what was important in the Roman culture of Paul's day and time, first and foremost, in order for a child to be adopted, especially if his or her father was still alive, it was not a simple thing because the child essentially had to go before the magistrates and renounce his or her family of origin. And say, I no longer belong to John Doe and Jane Doe. I'm giving up those family ties and I'm walking away from it to enter into a new family relationship. And in the same sense, the parents would be cutting ties with the child as if they had never had that child. You know, when we think about our world today, adopted relationships, there can be times where a child will try to go back and find his or her actual biological parents. And do that in the Roman culture of Paul's day and time. When you said, I'm leaving one situation to enter into a new family situation, it was as though you were dying to one family and becoming alive to a new family. And to show you how important this was, you had witnesses, seven witnesses that would be present to testify to what was happening, that this arrangement was valid, that the person had transferred all rights and all relationships from one family to another family. And that's why it's so important what Paul says here about the Spirit bears witness that we're children of God. 
The Spirit of God validates that we really belong to God and we are sons and daughters of the King. And when we enter into the family of God, it's a lot like what Paul would have known from his Roman world. We're cutting ties. We're renouncing the name of that old family. And for Paul here, that old family would be the sin nature of the flesh. And I'm now taking on a new family name. And we might say that new family name is in Christ. It's a strong break between one side and the other. The old family relationship, the new family relationship. The flesh and who we were before Christ to who we now are in Christ. Here Paul doesn't allow for any blurring of the lines. There can't be any going back and forth in the relationship. Well, I think I'm going to go visit my biological parents. I think I'm going to go visit the flesh for a little bit. Paul's saying here that now that you're in the family of God, you have broken ties with who and what you were yesterday. And now you are a part of the family of God. And because of that, you can refer to God as Father. Abba, the Aramaic word for Daddy. A very personal, intimate, one-on-one -on -one kind of relationship with God where you no longer have to fear God as judge who's always out to get you, to zap you when you do something wrong. But now through Christ and what Christ is doing in your life, you can look at the Father and know that the Father looks at you as a son and daughter and truly cares about who you are. And because you're a part of the family of God, as he says there, we become heirs. And join heirs with Christ. The reason that's so important to the text is because of the family structures in that particular day and time about the oldest son getting the greater portion and so forth. Not when it comes to a relationship with God as Father. It's not about favorites. It's not about one child being more special to God than another. We get all of the blessings and all of the benefits that God has for us. Just as His Son Christ was raised from the dead, so also do we get that assurance of resurrection from the dead when we leave this life. The same spirit. Nobody receives more Holy Spirit sometimes, I believe, or more filled with the Holy Spirit. Absolutely. And that's the difference between the Spirit just existing in us and us truly living by the Spirit and letting the Spirit really take over and have its way within us. But then let's close with this. It's all warm and fuzzy to focus on that. I'm a part of the family of God, as that hymn says by Bill Gaither. But then there's the if condition there as the verses conclude, if in fact we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. We enter the family of God not simply to get all of the good stuff, all of the blessings, but there's also that if we're willing to suffer, and that goes back to a lot of what Jesus said time and time again in his teachings, that unless we're willing to renounce ourselves and take up our cross daily and follow him, we're not fit for the kingdom of God. Yes, Christ lived a sinless life, but Christ also died, didn't he? He was rejected by sinful people. He was died. Yes, he was resurrected. But he didn't have the easiest of lives, the easiest of ministries. Some people loved him to death, and some people were trying to kill him before he started good. Paul says that could be a possibility for us too. We can't just think about a relationship with God because of all the great things it's going to bring into our lives, but it may come with its share of heartaches and 
challenges and valleys that we've got to crawl through. And that's something we've got to be willing to think about. If, if you're willing to take the good stuff that the kingdom of God will supply to your life, then you must also realize it may come at a cost. And it has happened for generations of Christians, and we see it happening in pockets around the world today where people literally will give life and limb because of their profession of faith in Jesus Christ. They know that Christ gives them a new life, a new peace, a new hope, but they also realize that with that is going to come some kind of struggle, not if, but when. Paul doesn't try to mislead people and say, oh, do this, that, and the other, and life's going to be great for you. When you think about Paul doing some of his best and most beautiful writing, especially in Philippians, you got to remember that guy was in prison at that time. But then you hear him talking about, I can do all things through Christ. Wait a minute. But then how many people use that to the advantage of a prosperity gospel? You think it, you believe it, you receive it. Paul says, yes, there's a lot to be gained through a relationship with God through Jesus, but you need to be willing to suffer along the way too. Thoughts or comments as we wrap up this morning? I would like to read something. Sure. Went through, um, what we just talking about. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his suffering. Hmm. And Jesus was very upfront with people. Lord, I'll follow you wherever you go. Let me go back and bury my father. Let me go back and tie up some loose ends at home. Lord, I want to follow you, but I've got a lot of possessions and I can't let go of my worldly goods to follow you. What does Jesus say? No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the work of the kingdom. This world is so enticing. Hmm. you got to stand. Absolutely. Got so many simple enticements to make you turn and look back. There's a lot of what I did. And that's where the difference between simply having the Spirit and actually living and walking in the Spirit are radically different things. Hmm. Thank y'all for being here this morning. Thank you all for viewing via the web stream and I ask God's blessings to be with you all as well. Let's close in a moment of prayer as we seek to go out and serve others this day. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the blessing of this day. We thank you for the new quality of life, the new family relationship that we experience through Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Lord, allow your spirit to fill us, not to simply take up one little compartment of our lives, but to fill us in such a way that we are led and guided and directed by the spirit day in and day out. Whether we're at church, whether we're at home, whether we're out in society, where there are going to be a lot of things that can entice us and cause us to slip up, may we truly be focused with our hearts and our minds and our vision forever upon the Spirit and where He would lead us and where we should be going as your people. Be with us now as we go our separate ways. Give us traveling mercies, Father, and bring us back together, Lord, at your appointed time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.